I got a call. Well, I, you know, Randy was trying to set this up, and then I talked to folks, and they said, "Well, we have no travel budget." So I said, "Well, I'll just take the day off and talk about what I've been doing at home." And I say, "Yes, you can do this." <laughs> um, so what do you need? Well, I got a used server from a buddy for a couple hundred bucks. It was uh, got extra memory for it. I've got it up to 44 gig now. Had to get a SIM card because that legacy version of the wind, uh, the Intel server, the SATA channels are rather underwhelming. Uh, a couple of drives and, you know, internet connection, 50 bucks a month, it just comes out of the Netflix play, you know. No big deal there. And then uh, software, you know, right now I'm running Ubuntu 1804 and 1604. Uh, Blablas, Grass, Poodle, a little bit of Docker, and, you know, it's all free, you get the idea. How do you afford it? <laughs> I had to rent one of my kids out. <laughs> no warranties on those. All right. So, so what, how did I do this? Well, first, I did bulk download of LiDAR data from NOAA. I was interested in the southeastern portion of Virginia, and I just looked to see whatever they had. Uh, there's a, a couple of watersheds that flow from Virginia into North Carolina, and I wanted to make sure I included whatever they had from that. And I want everything to be in the same projection. Because my eventual goal was to go ahead and compare it to the National Land Cover data set, which is in Albers Meters, Net 83, F650, 70 for the moment. The next the change to the next version. And um, when you do that, you've got to recreate the DEM. By reproducing a DEM, it, it, the cells get a little funky, so I needed to recreate the DEM. Uh, and then I wanted to process the LiDAR data at 30 meters, 10 meters, and at, at 20 foot, mainly to fit up with the North Carolina data that already exists. So downloading up data from NOAA, it's actually fairly easy. You go to their uh, website, um, and you just put a polygon up, and it lights up what projects are available. And this one right here was one I got for this section. North data. Now you'll see that highlighted area with the uh, bulk download. That's the way to go because you can just go to their bulk data download section. They will give you a wget customized string that you can use with either Windows or Linux, and pop it in there. And oh, I don't know, 12 hours later, depending on your internet speed, you've got all the data for that project in LAZ format, but it's in WGS84. The, the vertical datum is uh, GOA12A or 12D, which matches up with NAVD88. So it's got to be reprojected. So to do that, you use Poodle. Uh, Poodle makes it a little bit easy, easy in that it allows you to do horizontal and vertical uh, Datums. Now the thing is you have to specify both the horizontal and vertical, otherwise, at least at the 1.6 version of Poodle, it will default to the WGS84 geo. So how to get it on there? Well, I was doing that on Ubuntu 1604 at the time and I could not for the life of me get that to version 1.6 to compile on Ubuntu 1604. So I just gave up and uh, got a Docker instance and threw it on my Linux box and wrote a Python script that threw every tile at that Docker instance and had it reprojected and throw it out for the director. <coughs> now, the good news is at version 1.7 and above that uh, Poodle will compile just nicely on, on Linux. I don't know how it works on Windows because I haven't tried that. Uh, the only, because the downside of using Docker is it kind of took over my computer and wouldn't let me do much else. And I find that very disappointing. Um, so this is the ugly Python code version. Did you, did you pull it? Cover your eyes. <laughs> this is ugly Python code. And all it basically does is puts together a, a string of text to run the Poodle Docker instance do Poodle translate, which is what the reprojection command is for, it, and then give it an input and output directory and the reprojection. This is in uh, the vertical data in meters, and 
that's uh, the 5070 horizontal for the USGS data. So, PEM creation. There are a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, there's a really nifty program called uh, BSERF RST, which is multi-threaded, that allows you to do uh, large data sets, but it takes a fair amount of time even though it is multi-threaded, and it takes a fair amount of memory. But I said, well, I'm really not trying to make it a hydrologic model. I just want to get a basic ground level that I can do uh, vegetation height analysis and structure from. So I just went ahead and set the cell size to five foot, and I told it to say, give me, for all the ground points in each project, give me the mean height of the ground point within that five foot cell. And that would leave me holes that are for the buildings, uh, for data voids and swampy areas, and for the uh, uh, other wet areas. So I <coughs> used a new plugin for grass called R Fill Gaps, which very quickly allows you to do IDW manipulation <coughs> between gaps. And you can give it the distance. I used a very small distance. So that, you know, if you have a, a hole right here for a building and you say, okay, it's a fairly big building, I want to have it go 50 cells. Well, within the 50 cell distance, you have a big hill here that it's going to interpolate down and put a big hole underneath your building. So what I did was I just did five cells and did it recursively. And I usually ended up doing between 15, sometimes 20, because there are some really big shopping malls and big factories in Virginia that need to, you know, that had no ground points underneath them. Uh, now, the thing is that RN LiDAR uses this DEM to subtract the value from the Z value of the points. So, for example, here's the ground surface and here's your point cloud. The interpolated, I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit. Here's your five foot DEM. What you can do with, lot, with R and LiDAR is it will take the values uh, at the five foot footprint and correct the Z values to the points in the point cloud. And then when you come back and do your analysis, like your max height or whatever, it will go across those and use the corrected values for each one of those. So it does it very quickly, and it's very handy to be able to do it. Um, uh, you can actually string together and give it an ASCII list of LAS files. So for each project area, in this case a lot of them were multi-county, I would create one seamless five-foot DEM, and then I would, for every LAS, and uh, this is part of it, the RN LiDAR, is that you give it an ASCII list of all the LAS files in there, you say, okay, I'm going to work in this extent. Here's the list of files. And it treats all the LAS files as if they were one contiguous data source. It makes it very easy to work with large LiDAR data sets. <coughs> all right. So grab the NLCD data from USGS. It's an IMG file or an SMNG file. And rather than import it into GRASS, you can just link it to it on the from the GRASS data set, you can link to the actual file so you don't have to duplicate the data. And then I went ahead and aligned the cells. So when you designate your workspace in GRASS, you said give it an extent and a resolution when you're working. So the thing that I do is that you'll have your NLCD, which is a 30 meter bunch of 30 meter cells, I set the resolution for output data set to exactly match the footprint of the NLCD cells. So as I was doing work at the, uh, well, let's say this is the 30 meter, that, that would be the output. I would, so I would get a data set at 30 meters that exactly matched the NLCD. And then I went ahead back in 10 meters and I created a 10 meter data set that was exactly nested in each 30 meter cell. 
And the 20 meter, uh, 20 foot cell, I just matched up with some reprojected North Carolina data that already existed. All right. Okay, processing. Need lot less right now for R and LIDAR. That does not compile in Ubuntu 1804. I had to, uh, when I was, I started this in, when I was running 1604 and I moved to 1804 and then found out about this. That was unfortunate. Uh, but so, since the Linux distribution comes with virtualization in it, I just created a virtual instance of 1604 mapped it to NFS map all the data directories, and I run all my current RN LiDAR under the 16.04 version of Graph 7.4, and then I do the manipulation back on 18.04. All right, so, so it, when it comes out, it looks something like this. So you can see up there, that's the 30 meter resolution canopy heights. Here's the 10 meter <coughs> resolution. And there are the 20 foot resolutions right here. And this is one of the projects. It's, uh, it's the same density uh, as the QL2 LiDAR they're talking about for Tennessee. This was about a 10 county area on the west side of the Chesapeake Bay. And then uh, there's 2012 project, 2013 project. 2012, and then a 2014 project. So when I got done with them, I just popped them all together. And this is the 10 meter version of the elevation. And so now I've got a 10 meter resolution seamless canopy height for this section of Eastern Virginia. This area down here has already been flown this winter, and I expect it'll be delivered sometime either um, later this year or early next year. All right, and you may have noticed that a couple of my county boundaries were a little flat. I was more interested in the, the this uh, watershed over in here than I was up there, so in a couple of these things I got the patient and just chopped them off. I'm actually going back and, and refilling those in a little bit. I don't know what's going on there with King William County. That may be a separate data set that I'll have to go back and grab again. All right, so I wanted to simplify my heights a little bit and just say what's forced and what's not forced. The USDA has a nice website where they tell you what different heights of vegetation are qualified. Uh, zero to uh, half meter is low to none, uh, or is none, and then um, subshrub is half meter to one meter. One meter to five meters, actually four to five, but I'm taking five is shrub, and everything above five meters forced. For, so I took my canopy height layer, and I just said, everything that's five meter and above is forced, everything below is not forced. Now you also have buildings that mix in with that as well that are probably gonna end up looking like forced. I tend to leave them in when I'm doing canopy height, because I'm thinking in the background of bird habitat, and birds will not fly through buildings. They know they're there, and that's part of their cognitive sphere. So, uh, I go through. I did go through and get some building information, and I said non-building is zero. I mean, non-force is zero. Force is one, and the building footprints are going to be value two. So, where did I get them? Microsoft. Those of you who want to grab that at home. All 50 states. You can go to their GitHub site and you can download a zip file that has them as one huge honking GeoJSON file, which is really painful to work with. So, what you do is you just fire up OGR and say OGR to OGR, file, output file format, GeoPackage. We're branding GeoPackage. Yep. <laughs> it's all and, tying back together. And uh, you go ahead and, and throw it out to a geo package. And uh, it goes, it's in WGS84 projection. So you need to reproject it to whatever you're using by projecting the vectors to uh, average meters. And uh, well, convert it to a geo package, open it up in QGIS, and said, ah, I need this in Alvers, right click, export as, and 
and reprojected it that way. It doesn't take that long. One thing I did was about doing the OGR to OGR. <coughs> I did it at work on a Windows computer, and it took 30 gig of RAM to do North Carolina. I did it the same state at home on my Linux box, and it took next to no one. So I don't know why there's that disparity, but it was interesting. All right, so I'm here to think about it. Um, so I, then I import this vector layer that I reprojected into Grass using B and OGR, and then I set the region to match the 10 meter. So the cell size would be 10 meter, and then I told it to do B to Rax. And the way that works is that it will look in the center of every 10 meter cell and it will take the value of the polygon that's in the center of that cell and make the cell that value. So I rasperized the polygons that way, so it's a 10 meter building footprint. It may be, you know, it's gonna be a little blocky compared to what you can get from the original source, but I was trying to make things match up. And then I uh, set all the value of building rasters together, merged them together, and my final raster for that looks like this. So that your uh, yellow pixels right here are buildings, the green are forest, and the sort of purplish gray ones, got color vision like mine, that's non-forest. So then you just use the run R report function. And you, you can do fun things with R report, and then you can nest rasters. So the first raster that you set is, uh, well then you can calculate the statistics from the second raster nested in each category of that. And I also eliminated all the no data areas because I had a bunch of them. So this is what you get in some basic results. And as we're looking at, these are the NLCD classes, 11 open water, 21 developed, uh, open space, and then low intensity developed, medium intensity, high density. And you go over here and look at it, and you can see that, I really miss my sharp laser. <laughs> you can see that the percent cover of each of the habitat types uh, or classifications, and then you can see which percent are forest, non-forest, and building. And if you look at the, de the uh, developing, as you go to more developed, you do see that the percentage of buildings climbs pretty regularly. It's what you expect. Now then we get into the uh, other ones, barren lands. There's not much barren land in this area. It's only 0.36% of the whole area. But you'll see that 22% uh, of the barren land is actually forced by height. It's a little bit interesting. And then you get into the deciduous forest. That's actually pretty good. You're getting over 90% in all the forest classes actually being forced by height. And then we hit shrub shrub. And that's where you find out that things that are supposed to be less than five meters well, about 80% of them are five meters and above. So a lot of what it looks like, at least in this section of Virginia, looks like they are undercounting forest in favor of calling it shrub shrub instead. And that's about eight, that's a little over 8% of the land area. So that's actually fairly significant. And just to finish it out, grassland, there, Calling, what they're calling grass point is about 40% forest. And I don't know if that's because it's the boundaries between the grassy areas that may be forested. Maybe it just may be overpowered by the grass signature on 30 meter pixel. Um, pasture hay, that's down to 20%. That's more likely a single thing. And then you have the cultivated crops, which includes orchards. That's around 20%. So I'm not too concerned about that. Uh, then you get into woody wetlands, and you're back to 91%, which is kind of what you expect for swamps. And if you think back about the shrubby areas, what was happening before, then it's quite likely that's more woody wetlands. And then the emergence are 23%, of course. So it, the spectral signature may not be telling 
uh, may be overpowered in some respects in the shorter areas and may not be telling the true case in some of these, these uh, vegetation classifications. All right, then just because I had uh, these 10 meter pixels and had the forest, no forest, I said let's do just a, a simple calculation of the percentage of each pixel which is forest. So I just take that three by three, I do a three by three neighborhood in grass, our neighbors, with the sum, and then you divide that by nine, and you take the value of convert it back to a, a 30 meter pixel, and it'll take the center value to get that 30 meter value. And so in this case, this pixel would be a 44% force pixel. And if you carry that out across all of them, then you start looking at the mean forest, percent forest for your each pixel class. And you're right at 23% for that emergent, and our shrub scrub, still about 79%. And you can go through each and every one of them. And it's still a work in progress. I just slapped these, uh, the different projects together. There's significant overlap between them. And uh, a more, if I wanted to get a, a more rigorous data set out of it, I would go through and, and do masking so that the most recent data would be on top. That's one thing that I want to do. And I'm also already working on doing percentage of the points that fall at different heights. Uh, one to three meters, three to seven meters, similar to what uh, Jitu is doing with his work. He's just doing it finer because he's got more computers. <laughs> uh, the skewness analysis, I, I like that because it gives me an idea of how shrubby things are versus uh, I, it gives you uh, a positive skewness is that things tend to be shrubby towards the ground. Uh, negative skewness, more of the vegetation is toward the top of the canopy. And uh, if it's evenly distributed, it usually ends up being close to zero. And I want to compare the bird data. I like birds. They're fun to play with. And they have very specific habitat requirements, which means that you can pull them out. Uh, you should be able to pull them out in the LiDAR data as being distinct from each other, as other people have seen. And uh, yeah, I've got to do some metadata for this and share with the folks who are interested. I've already shared a preliminary data set with some of the Emerald Sea folks, and they're very interested in that. Um, hopefully, they'll help down the road in, in improving the very good product that they do have at the Emerald Sea, considering it's a 30 meter resolution product. It's pretty standardized nationwide. It's, it's pretty decent stuff. Uh, and that's about where I sit right now. Uh, things out to the grass folks. Being able to process this LiDAR data at such a large extent in one shot, they just make it easy. It's just silly how easy it is. NOAA folks making that bulk data readily accessible. Martin Eisenberg, giving him a shout out, coming up with the compressed LiDAR format. It's an open standard. Uh, Poodle developers, that looks like it's kind of going to be the future, might be the future back end for grass. And uh, the MRLC folks, they're great. Yes, I am going to thank Microsoft or something for making those building footprints publicly available. And if you want to try this at home, here is a tutorial that is written for those who have never used brass and want to play with brass LiDAR. Then you can go ahead and uh, download that. There are sample data sets available. And just, uh, it's actually set up for someone who's using Windows. So if you download the latest version of Crash for Windows, then that will probably work out well for you. And that's about all I've got. Do you have any questions? Yes. So uh, there are different versions of NLCD. We are using the NLCD that's closest yes. the acquisition date for the line. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, I was a little bit rushed on getting this together. It's the 2011 NLCD from the 2014 uh, compilation of it. I know the 2016 is supposed to come out at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, that kind of happened. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> our observation is that 
none, none of the NLCDs are, there's no accuracy assessment via the confusion map matrix for states. They have one for the whole nation. If you look at the middle thing. Mm. Ah, okay. I mean that you you are always ahead of that. This is like a scalpel versus a meat cleaver. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's, right. it's, it's, it, that's I have to admit, you know, it, it is like like uh, expect you're expecting too much, I think, from the data. You try to get the, the heights that way. But it does give them an idea down the road. And I think if they do incorporate the LIDAR data sure. into their work, then they'll get a much better product. And I'm hoping that it'll be a higher resolution product. At, uh, the 2016, from what I understand, will be a, still a 30 meter product. How long does it take to run Virginia? I guess from a LIDAR standpoint. And you throw all the stuff at it in, what, a week? 10 days? Or oh, what? Three minutes? Well, it takes it. it well, the poodle stuff, the, the reproduction of the poodle data, that the largest area that I was doing actually took a couple of days just to, to reproject all those points from the 2014 data. Oh, um, and then it, doing the canopy heights at the different resolutions, it takes longer the finer scale that you do. It takes a little bit more memory resources. The uh, R and line R is single threaded. You only use one CPU core at a time. I've, talk to the, uh, the, the current, the person who has uh, done the most current work on R and LiDAR, and he indicates that it, it could be made multi-threaded, he just, and he has an idea how to do it, he just doesn't have the time or funding to do that yet, mm -hmm. so that would be another thing to do. Uh, there is an R in Poodle that's out there right now, but it doesn't, uh, it's a, uh, Poodle pipelines with Python scripts. It does not, from what I understand, use the C++ uh, interface. So it doesn't allow you to do the same things that you can do with the R and LiDAR right now with the Live Blast backend. Mm -hmm. But hopefully that will, that will uh, migrate over time. Yes? You mentioned reprojecting a DEM from LiDAR that had some well, it's uh, if you reproject a DEM, you're going to do it's going to be doing some interpolation of the cells, and so what I decided to do was just go ahead and reproject all the points and regenerate the DEM uh, exactly in the projection that I'd be working with, just because I was being honest. I mean, <laughs> to be honest, I mean, just I wanted to be really specific about that. I wanted to not introduce any any. Kind of error. At that scale, it probably wouldn't have made uh, that much difference, but I was kind of curious as to how fast and how effective uh, doing this other method would be, and I kind of like it, to tell you the truth. That sounds like something that actually could be made parallel as well. Uh, I think that's about all I got. Can I ask like five minutes worth of questions up here next? Eh, okay. All right. <laughs>